Evet, Bismillah, Elhamdülillah, ve Salatü Selamu Resulillah. Allahümme le sahle illa ma cahilte ve sahlem. Ente tecahil hazine ila şeyde sahlem. Rabbi şahli sadri ve esirli emri ve ahlal uqdeten min lişani yefkahu qavli. In, uh, in this topic, which is really compli- complicated, which is democracy, uh, whenever you have a question, just stop me and ask. Do not lose the question. We have lots of things that are going to come. I'm going to cover the topic, inshallah, over two uh, sessions. So this week and next week, inshallah. But uh, mainly this session, I'm going to speak about democracy uh, in general and democracy uh, mostly within the Muslim countries. And then the next week will be democracy within the non-Muslim countries. I'm going to speak about some parts which is within the non-Muslim countries, but we will inshallah discuss in details about Muslim minority living in democracy within the, the West. So I will start as an introduction that Allah Azza wa Jal chose the Arab for the message. Not because they are better than the other nations, but to take the responsibility of spreading the message of Islam. Scholars spoke about many reasons why Allah Azza wa Jal chose the Arabs to handle the message of Islam. At that time, the Arabic language was really strong enough to handle the words and the meanings of the Quran. And it was really mature to the top that there is nothing to come after. So if you look at the other languages, for example, other languages, um, they are still premature. So you can see that For example, English language, still they are developing new terminologies, new words. And the other as well, languages as well. But the Arabic language at that stage reached the maturity. So it can handle all the meanings and the required things from uh, the Quran. The other thing is that the message came to the Arabs, where at that stage the Arabs were not allied to any of the surrounding empires. So not the Romans, not the Persians, not the Hindus, not the whatever in in Africa was. They were just like left alone. So that when Islam is going to be uh, flourishing and spreading, it's not going to be said that it's spread because of the power of the Romans or the Persians or, no, it was uh, just a nation which hasn't been uh, an interest of any other nation to take over. So it was left alone. And there are many other reasons. But uh, Allah Azza wa chose the Arab to take the responsibility of spreading the message of Islam. Tyranny is Arab. What's tyranny is Arab? Does anyone know what's the meaning of Tyranny? Like a? Oppressor? Does anyone know what's the, the, the meaning of the word tyranny? Look it up. Can someone look it up? Oppressive government or mm, dictator. So this this uh, characteristic is a matter of difference in opinion between the scholars whether actually a dictatorship is built within the human beings or dictatorship is built uh, while the person is growing. But uh, just let me 
check something. So, so this, this character, sometimes people refer to the Arabs as oppressors or having that tyranny or willing to enforce their opinion. opinion. But it's a matter of actually difference in whether actually it's a characteristic within the Arabs themselves or within the human beings in general. And we have seen lots of non-Arabs actually that were dictators around the world. So it's not a matter that is just sticking to the uh, Arabs. The Prophet ﷺ uh, said in the Hadith Qudusi that Allah Azzawajal said, I created my servants hunafa, clean. Then the devils attacked them. So meaning that when we speak about, and all this, these are topics uh, related to democracy because we want to reach why democracy and is democracy acceptable in Islam or not. So we are speaking about oppressing and we are speaking about dictatorship and how Allah Azza wa created people as Hunafa, clean, meaning that they were without that dictatorship and then the devils attacked them and made them dictators. Scholars differed whether heart diseases, for example, are things that are born with people or are things that are uh, not born with people, but people actually uh, take these while they are living. So those who said that diseases are born with people, they refer to the incident of the Prophet ﷺ when he was young, when the angels came and he was around four uh, years old and they opened his chest and took his heart and took that black thing from his heart, washed his heart, returned it back. So they said that based on that, that the, the person will be born with that black thing. And when he grows up, he can work on his own characteristics and remove these heart diseases from himself. Whereas others said that the Prophet ﷺ said, that the person will be born on fitrah and his parents will make him Jew or Christian or Muslim or pagan or anything. So it's a matter of difference, but definitely the person will be born with something in the heart and the person is born clean without sins, yes, but the person needs to work on himself in order to remove all of these heart diseases. The first question that has always been raised. What has the scholars to do with politics? Why should they interfere with politics? We need to understand that for every single matter in this life, are you hearing me? All right. For every single matter in this life, Allah has a rule that he set for that matter. So meaning that, uh, maybe push the uh, chairs outside and close the door. That's better. So, every matter that we face in our life, Allah has a rule in it. And we as Muslims, we need to refer back to that rule. So the politics is not different than the non-politics matters. So we cannot, as Muslims, look at the matters that are arising from the political uh, incidents are different than the matters that are arising from non-political incidents. Islam did not come only for just wudu and salah and siyam. No, it came as well for politics, and government and all matters related to the country.
So that's why it's very important to understand that we are not limiting Islam to only ibadat, worships. Islam is a, a wider uh, topic that covers everything. The answer is fiqh is a speciality like medicine and chemistry. The student need to study everything in that branch. The scholar will cl clarify the rule of Allah Azza wa Jal in each matter of life and politics is one of these matters. For Allah, there is a rule in each case. Religion is regulations where human matters should be organized according to it. So when we speak about human matters, every single matter in our life is a matter that religion has a regulation in it. When we stop thinking like this, we are starting secularizing the, the world. So when we stop saying that there is, there is a relationship between religion and my personal life, then I need to ask the religion about every matter in my personal life, then I will become a secular person which is splitting this life from the religion. And that happened actually um, a couple of hundreds of years ago when the secular idea started, where they started in, in, the, in Europe to actually eliminate the church from interfering with the matters of the country. Islam organizes the relationships between people and their Lord and between people themselves. So when we speak about between people and their Lord, are these, these are the worships. When speaking about between people and themselves, we are speaking about all of types of transactions, whether they are uh, money transactions or political uh, relationships and so on. All of these matters are being actually handled by Islam. Without the religion, regulations are poor. The regulations, uh, without the religion regulations, poor or rich people can use any means to achieve their goals. For example, a poor person might actually steal in order to feed. A, a rich person might cheat in order to actually uh, oppress the others and take more wealth. But religious regulations come in order to control the life. So we don't have oppression and we don't have people who get oppressed. So uh, the regulations, we speak about religious regulations. Why did we speak about religious regulations? Because we have regulations. But they are not religious regulations. These are secular regulations. There is a big difference between the religious regulations and the secular regulations. Regulations made by human minds have defects, as no human brain is complete. So this is the difference between regulations on their own and religious regulations. Religious regulations are coming from whom? From Allah Azza Human-made or man-made regulations are coming from the men themselves, from human themselves. So, there is a defect in every human mind. Every human thinks that he thinks the right way. And he is the most mature person. But, actually Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who created us, who knows for us the best. That's why he is the only one who has the right to put the regulations for us. So human regulations always, they have defects, and that's why in the democratic countries, they always change the laws, change the laws, and that's because of the defect of the human mind. People differ in their mind, but will not differ when regulations are coming from Allah Azza wa Jal. So when we have stealing is haram, so stealing is haram. When we have alcohol is haram, alcohol is haram. This is a regulation that's coming from Allah. When human mind comes, now if we say, for example, for all human beings, 
Can you vote whether alcohol is halal or haram or is, is good or bad? You will have the majority speaking that alcohol is good because majority are consuming alcohol. Regardless of all the scientific facts that they are bad and they are harmful. So Allah Azza wa Jal knows better. So he is the one who sets the regulations for us. In Islam, there are no people called religious people. Why? Because every person needs to practice Islam. Unfortunately, this term, which is religious person, came to uh, explain about someone who is practicing Islam. It's supposed to be everyone who is practicing Islam. But they, they initiated this term to refer to the person who is practicing the rules of Islam and the regulations of Islam. Religious person is coming only from Christianity and the priest and the rabbis and the Jews and so on. It is required for everyone who wants to practice politics to have fiqh knowledge. So whoever wants to practice politics, he cannot jump into politics without studying the fiqh of Islam. Why? Because in fiqh, he will find the solution and the answers for any question that he has in politics. Because political questions are really complicated. If he is not educated in fiqh, and he went, for example, to Parliament House. He went for, a, for example, to become a Parliament member, and he won, and he was in the Parliament. And then in the Parliament, there are lots of things that have been discussed. What is his situation over there? For example, as a Muslim, he wants to go to the parliament and they want to discuss, for example, anything that is contradicting with Islam. So what is his ruling? This is part of the democracy that we are living within. So the politics or the politician needs to study fiqh. Or the other solution is that we have the knowledgeable in fiqh, sitting next, next to the politician, speaking to each others, coming to the actually conclusion of what are the answers of all the political problems that we are facing. So it is very important for us to understand that any politician needs to have fiqh before he goes into politics. Differentiating between fiqh and politics is bid'ah. And this is agreed between all the scholars. Why? Because politics is part of the life. So as if you want to say that fiqh cannot interfere with the politics, this is bid'ah. Because Islam has the answer for each question. The Muslim characteristics make him political person as it is his duty to guide people by truth. So when the Muslim wants to pass the message of Islam, politics will come in his way. If he agrees or if he doesn't agree, when he wants to spread the message of Islam, he needs to, to, to hit politics. So in nature, one of the characteristics of the Muslim is to be a political person because he needs to use politics in order to spread the message of Islam. Politics is part of the fiqh chapters. So, if you open open a fiqh book, which is which might be really big, maybe a couple of tens of volumes, you will find one or two volumes about politics. So, the fiqh of politics. Recently, some people, uh, actually some scholars, they have uh, written some books in political uh, politics in Islam, and they spoke lots of. Uh, details about what can be done and what cannot be done. Let's speak about democracy now. What is democracy? Don't look at it. Can someone tell me what's the definition of democracy? Shamil, what's the definition of democracy? Yeah. Based on the, uh, 
making decisions based on the votes of people. What's democracy? What? Parul. <laughs> you are? You don't know. Do you know what's democracy? Anyone knows what's democracy? Best interest of people? Okay. All right. So we have to differentiate between two types of democracy. The first type of democracy, democracy is a philosophy that organizes people life without religious interference and make humans as controllers of the whole life without them binding to any rule, which is the rule of Allah. So what does that mean? Meaning that the humans themselves, they vote to put the rules of their own life. Okay? So in this, democracy is a philosophy to create the rules and to organize the life. Okay? So these are two things. Generating the rules without the interference of any religion and then controlling the life. There is another form of democracy which is to apply the shura and remove oppression. So democracy is a way to reach the best way of life by consulting people in their own matters. Mm. So, from these two definitions, what is the, 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 the difference between democracy type 1 and democracy type 2? Shura. Shura is a system that Allah Azza wa Jal ordered us to use in judging between people or in ruling people. Allah Azza wa Jal said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Amr and have shura in the matter amongst them. And in another verse, وَأَمْرُهُمْ shura بَيْنَهُمْ And his, their matter is shura amongst them. Okay, shura, you can like you can ex explain it like consultation between each others. So you might think, is it democracy or it's not democracy? Well, there is a big difference between these two. The first type of democracy is the Western democracy, where actually the two things have been decided by the human beings, which are the rules and who is going to rule and how he is going to rule. So these two things being decided by human beings. Whereas in the second portion, only who is going to rule and how he is going to rule is being decided by people. But what are the regulations to be used for ruling are not decided by people. They are decided by Allah Azza wa Jal. So someone would like to call it as partial democracy. If you want, you can call it. Because in Islam, we know that nobody has the right to put regulations except Allah Azza wa Jal. So democracy we make it as a mean, as a tool. We make them share their opinions and decide based on majority and can be from top leader to small things. But all of that in things that there are now rulings in Islam that are coming from Allah Azza wa Like for example, they want to decide how to choose a leader. Okay, let's have a shura. How to choose a leader. Everybody will make his opinion. Let's vote 
Okay, vote, democracy, the, the majority take the vote. That's a, so a form of democracy. But did we actually interfere with the regulations of Allah Azza wa Jal? We did not. Do you understand the difference? So in this matter, we go with the majorities, and even Allah Azza wa Jal asked the Prophet Sallallahu to ask the opinion of the companions in their matters. وَشَاوَرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ Take their opinion in the matter. Shura is a goal. So Allah Azza wa Jal asked for the shura. So, for example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made a shura about the battle of Uhud between the companions. Who thinks we go out to Uhud and fight them over there? The old people raise their hands. Who thinks, uh, sorry, the, the young people raise their hands. Who thinks that we stay in the city and defend the enemies from the city? The old people raise their hands. But the young people number was bigger, so the Prophet ﷺ went with the majority. There is no regulation in this. This is shura. And uh, you want to call it democracy? It's up to you. We are going to explain the details of the definition of democracy in how we can apply democracy without contradicting Islam. And we can still call it democracy. And actually, we should always call it democracy. And we should always say that we Muslims follow democracy. And we are democratic pe people. We are not dictators. But without contradicting his laws. How? This is how we need to be clever. Some people, they come to, to us saying, no, no, your democracy is not a democracy. Yeah, true. True. But we want to use the same name. To be clever. That we are taking the opinions of people. This is what we do as Muslims. We take the opinions of people. And the people give their opinions in almost everything. Apart from regulations. When it comes to rulings, what is allowed, what is not allowed, if Allah Azza wa has set a ruling for us, that's it. We cannot vote. Someone will vote. Can we allow, for example, pubs to open in Muslim countries? We cannot vote. Why? Because there is a rule in Islam about that. This is haram. It's not allowed. And so on. So if someone was in a parliament, and it has been actually um, a voting. Someone raised, I want to vote, for example, a Muslim country, parliament, and one or couple are non-Muslims and they wanted to pass a law to open some pubs, for example, in a Muslim country. And there is this in a democratic environment. Do they have the right to raise this? Well, this is the democratic environment. Okay, raise it. Now, the majority are Muslims, practicing Muslims. Can they vote yes for that? The answer, no way. So the majorities are going to say, no, it's going to, to, to be eliminated. But before that, the Muslims in a Muslim country should vote at the beginning. We want, which is the first... Uh, item in the constitution of any Muslim country that Islam is the source of each rule in the country. So when the Muslims vote for that and choose Islam as the source for each rule in the country, then that's it. Meaning that these public people, these people who are in the country are actually righteous people. They reach a stage that they want Islam to rule. So at the beginning, maybe the country was not ruled by Islam. And Islam is not the, in the constitution at all. But they have to put the effort in order to put Islam as the main source of ruling in the country, in that Muslim country. So they did the voting in a democratic way. And the majority voted for Islam to be the source of each regulation in the country. It's done. So we use democracy in order to do what? To implement 
the Islamic regulations. And after that, if someone came and wanted to actually raise a point that contradicts Islam, we'll say, hold on, this contradicts the Constitution. Why? Because the Constitution says that Islam is the source of each regulation. And in Islam, it's prohibited to sell alcohol or to open a pub. So this way, we close that door. So, But in some countries, even in some Muslim countries, they don't have that in their constitution. So they cannot actually do that and rule and say it's prohibited to even, uh, for example, propose a, a law like this or to open something like this. At the time of the Prophet wasallam, okay, Shura is a goal, and there is no way explained about how the Shura should be. So Allah Azza wa spoke about the Shura, and it has been implemented in many different ways, the Shura. And we are going to speak, even within the companions, the Shura was implemented in different ways. So there is no one specific way for the Shura. So Shura is a goal or a philosophy, or a system. It needs a tool. Like for example, who can be involved in voting for the leader? What is the age limit? Well, that's some regulations. Hasn't been mentioned in the Quran or the Hadith. But that has been left for the human beings to decide. So Allah Azza wa Jalla left it for us. You want to call it democracy? You can call it democracy. We want to put the cutoff of the age limit, who can vote, who can be nominated, who can be so and so. This part of democracy, yeah, no problems. This is a system. So long as we apply the Shura system, the tool which is democracy can be used. Some ways of applying Shura were seen from the righteous Khalifas, but it is not applicable these days. We are going to speak about the righteous Khalifas how they implemented shura. And can we apply this nowadays or not? At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, people were ordered to follow him. He was taking opinions in some matters. He sometimes said, you know better, your life matters. So the Prophet ﷺ used to take the shura. Tell me what's your opinion. And then he will try to take the majority opinion. And even the scholars, they differed. In politics, in Islam, is the shura binding, meaning that the majority voting binds the rule or not? Or it's the Amir ruling or opinion that is going to be the final decision. From companions, we have a generation that was approved by Allah Azza wa Jal. For example, better people, 313 people, were approved by Allah, meaning that Allah mentioned that he is satisfied from them. So if these people, the better people, came all together and said, we want to do this, for example, after the Prophet ﷺ passed away, they said, we think that the right opinion in this, well, if they all came to that, well, the, Allah Azza wa mentioned in the Quran that he is satisfied from them, meaning that he is satisfied from this, his, their opinion. As well, those who gave the pledge under the tree, which is the pledge of Ridwan. Well, those people as well, Allah Azza wa Jal said that Allah is being satisfied from those who gave you the pledge. Actually, at the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib, we had lots of trials at that time. In his time, he had 800 of the people of the pledge of Ridwan supporting him and saying to him, you are right. And Allah said to these people, and at the time when they gave the pledge, there were 1,050 people. So at the time of Ali ibn Abi Talib, maybe some passed away, 800 of the left actually were supporting Ali. And Allah mentioned in the Quran, Allah is satisfied from them, meaning that they will not actually collectively decide on something wrong because Allah is satisfied from them. These things were at the time of the Khalifas. Nowadays, do we have any of these things? Do we have someone who can be accepted by all Muslims that, okay, we will follow his opinion? 
Do we have anyone on earth like this? No way. So it's very important to understand that the situation at the time of the Khalifas is different. When Ali ibn Abi Talib raised the, the uh, thing of that, I have 800 of Bayat al-Radwan, the Pledge of Radwan. Everybody said, that's it. Done. We cannot oppose these people. But nowadays, yes, because we are going to contradict the Quran. But nowadays, looking at this situation, can someone claim, well, I have all of these Muslims with me, I am the majority. No one can claim anything because nobody is actually granted satisfaction from Allah Azza wa Jal. Look at uh, some applications, how the applications happen. How did Abu Bakr become a Khalifa? Anyone knows? Shura? No. Chaos. All the scholars, they said, picking Abu Bakr as a Khalifa is was, was just a, just, let's go. How did it happen? When they gathered, while the Prophet ﷺ has been announced as dead, they gathered in a place, and the Muhajirin and the Ansar, and the Abu Bakr and Umar, all of them were gathering, and they started discussing who's going to follow the Prophet ﷺ in leadership. And what happened? Does anyone know? Who was missing from that gathering? Do you know who? Ali. Ali ibn Abi Talib was missing from that gathering. He was busy by preparing the Prophet ﷺ body to be buried. So what did happen? What happened at that time? Some chaotic things happened and some people started saying, well, the, the Khalifa should be from us, the Khalifa should be from us. Amr ibn Khattab came to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq and he grabbed his hand and he said to him, I give you the pledge of the Khalifa. Straight away. So when people saw Amr ibn Khattab giving pledge to Abu Bakr, all of those in that tent came and gave the pledge to Abu Bakr. And then people knew about it. After that, Ali ibn Abi Talib knew about it. And he came on the same day and gave the pledge to Abu Bakr. And the whole ummah gave the pledge to the Abu Bakr. And nobody argued about that. But the way Abu Bakr Sadiq was chosen is a way that, imagine our Khattab giving the pledge to Abu Bakr. And then that's it. Everybody just followed. So you cannot say that this is a shura. Because everyone knew who is Umar, everyone knew who was Abu Bakr. Can we apply this nowadays? I come and say, you are the leader, I'm going to give my pledge to you to be the leader. And then everybody will say, no, I don't want. I disagree with that. Correct? So it's not, it's not applicable. Look at how Umar was picked. You know how Umar was picked? Umar was proposed by Abu Bakr Siddiq. So Abu Bakr Siddiq, before his death, he said, I am, I am satisfied that Umar be your leader. Okay? Was he a descendant of Abu Bakr? Did he propose or nominate his son? Or any of, or though Abu Bakr Siddiq had sons. But he did not propose any of his sons. He proposed Umar ibn Khattab. Knowing the sequence that the Prophet ﷺ put in the ahadith, from there he proposed, he nominated Umar ibn Khattab, and then it wasn't a force, but everyone else actually gave the pledge to Umar. So, nowadays, can this be implemented? So, for example, the leader of a country can come and say, well, guys, I want Shamil to be the president of Iksa after me. Please give him the pledge to be the president after me. Some people will say, hold on, why did you choose him? Why him? Why don't you take our opinion? Why don't you decide on your own? That doesn't really, um, it's, it's not a matter that uh, can be passed like this. But knowing who is Omar, and knowing who is Abu Bakr, that passed easily. So that system of shura cannot be passed nowadays 
like what passed at that time. After Omar being stabbed, and he knew he was going to die, so he wanted to nominate someone behind him. How did he do that? Do you know? Well, Omar al Khattab, in his death time, he nominated six and put them inside the house and said, you need to decide who's going to be your Khalifa. Three of the six, and these are the six that the Prophet ﷺ passed away and he is pleased from them. Do we have people who are, the Prophet ﷺ is pleased from nowadays? So we can say, the leader needs to be from these people. Or we know that Allah is pleased from these people. We don't have. We cannot apply it. It's unapplicable nowadays. So what happened is three out of the six withdrew for the three, the other three. So each one said, I will support him and I'm out. I will support him and I'm out. The three that were left were Abdurrahman bin Auf, Uthman and Ali. They were left. So Abdurrahman bin Auf said to Uthman and Ali, I will pull out under one condition. The choice is mine of who from you is going to be the Khalifa. So they both gave him that. They said, we agree on that. So Abdurrahman bin Auf went out and started speaking to the people. At that time, it was a Hajj time. So he started speaking to the tribes because the Islamic country is really big. So there were tribes coming from everywhere. So he started speaking to the tribes, to the countries, to the people, Sham, Iraq, wherever, Yemen, coming to the pilgrimage, to the Hajj, asking them, asking them, asking the women, asking the kids, asking the adults, asking everyone, and then came back to Uthman and Ali, and then he gave the pledge to Uthman, and Ali was the first one to give the pledge to Uthman after Abdurrahman bin Auf, and then people give the pledge to Uthman. Can someone tell us, can we apply this? Because remember, Shura is a, a sort of system. It needs a tool. This is a tool that Umar al-Khattab initiated, which is to choose the six, and then between them, they need to choose someone. So can we apply something like this nowadays? Knowing that Abdurrahman bin Auf, for example, was approved by the Prophet ﷺ in many hadiths, and he is that from one of the ten that were granted Jannah, and people believed that he is not going to say the wrong thing. But nowadays, this system cannot be applied. So we need something that can be actually applying shura, which Allah Azza wa Jal has ordered us to do. When Uthman was killed, it was supposed to be by default Ali, because Ali and Uthman were the last two, and the Ummah were agreeing on both Ali and Uthman. But yet Ali did not agree to become the Khalifa, except after taking the pledge from everyone, and everybody gave the pledge, except some people who refused to give the pledge until those who killed Uthman being uh, actually punished and killed and the, the uh, test happened between the Muslims. After that, trials started. And actually after that, un unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, Muslims fought with each other in battles. And we saw, for example, two armies, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan versus Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib, versus an army from Aisha radiallahu anha and the companions. Ibn Taymiyyah said, Subhanallah, except for the trials between the companions, we would never know the rules of fights between Muslims. Because there are rules when Muslims fight between each other. Allah Azza wa mentioned in the Quran, and if two believing groups fought with each other, so fix between them. When the companions actually fought with each other, they set the rules.
So the rules that they applied actually were written now in the uh, fiqh books about how to deal when two Muslim groups fight and what are the rulings in that matter. So the examples of the companions shura tool that they have used cannot be applied nowadays as some companions such as Abd rahman bin Auf was accepted by all Muslims. So when Abd rahman bin Auf stood and announced Uthman as the Khalifa, all the Muslims submitted because everybody trusted him. Nowadays, we don't have one name who can be trusted from all the Muslims. So we cannot apply the same uh, thing nowadays. So no one these days can be accepted by all Muslims. We need a tool. Muslims, unfortunately, during the last time, did not generate that tool. After the Khilafah, we are going to speak. Until now, it's just inheritance. Or what? Revolution. Coup or inheritance. Coup or inheritance. So it's, it's not a, a system that has been created by the Muslims for who is going to come after and lead the, the country. So, we are going to speak about that. This hadith is very important to understand. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, when he said, the prophethood will remain amongst you as long as Allah wills that it will remain. And then he will remove it when he intends to remove it. And Allah Azzawajal removed the prophethood when the Prophet ﷺ passed away. Then there will be a khilafah upon the way of the prophethood and it will continue as long as Allah wills it to continue. And then he will remove it when he intends to remove it. When was the khilafah being removed? By the death of Ali ibn Abi Talib. It has been agreed by all the scholars that the khilafah on the prophethood way has been removed. But some and almost all, they consider Umar bin Abdul Aziz who came after a couple of generations is from the Khilafah uh, Rashida, but he was just a short period of time, two years and a couple of months. Then there will be a harsh rule and it will continue as long as Allah wills it to continue and then he will remove it when he intends to remove it. And then there will be a coercive rule. Do you know what's the meaning of coercive? Can someone look it up? Because I know the meaning in Arabic. And the, the Arabic word is, is really uh, strong. Using force. I think yes. So it's it's. So you will be ruled. You will be ruled. I'm going to rule you. I'm going to rule you. I agree. You don't agree. I am your ruler. That's it. So, and this ruling, which. What has been until some, some stage and it will continue as long as Allah it wills it to continue and then he will remove it when he intends to remove it then there will be the khilafah upon the way of the prophethood which did not come yet so this khilafah upon the way of the prophethood is going to come and then the Prophet ﷺ kept silent. He did not say after that anything or what's going to happen after that. So these are the sequence of things we believe that we are in the last stage, which is the ruling by force. And this is happening in, we are speaking about the Muslim countries. We are not speaking about the Western countries. So all the Muslim countries are being led by force. So, democracy in its first meaning as a general f 
philosophy to replace Islamic regulation. It's prohibited. Democracy in its second meaning, it's a tool to apply shura, is accepted. Do you understand this important point? So when we speak about democracy, we need to understand what do we speak about. You can claim straight away that we are a democratic nation. Islam encourages democracy. But which democracy we encourage? Okay, first one or second one? The second one. Second one. Because nobody can rule apart from Allah Azza wa Jal. But Allah gave us the flexibility to see how we are going to rule. What are the steps that we can take? Yes. Like it's, it's exactly like the TV. Is the TV halal or haram? It depends how, how people use it. Can be haram, can be halal. Democracy is the same. Can be halal and can be haram. Do you understand this, this difference? What about the second option also contradicts Islam too? No way. It doesn't contradict. We are going to speak about... We are going to speak about this point, right. which is the voting, our voting in the West. Yeah. Can we vote? And when we vote to someone, for example, and then he votes in the parliament that he supports the marriage of the uh, homosexuals, yeah. and you voted him in, and he is voting in the parliament to support that. What's going to happen? How Allah is going to question us? All of these, what are the rules of Islam in this? We are going to speak, but this is next week, not this week. Okay? Evidence. Allah ordered to take shura from them, and he didn't explain how. So, democracy is a system, actually. Shura is an obligation and cannot be applied without a tool. So, we need a tool for shura. Can democracy be a tool for shura? Nowadays, we don't have except democracy as a tool. And it proved that in the West, it has given some stability and some safety for people. So democracy, forget about the rules itself. Always think about the system of voting, the system of choosing the leader, the system of all of these, they, they don't contradict Islam. The system of choosing the regulations is the point that we are not accepting because the regulations are all from Allah. So always differentiate between these two. Another term which is bay'a, pledge in Islam, is for Allah Azza wa Jal to obey Allah and that we obey that person if he ordered lawful and that he will apply what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam applied. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in the hadith, people will not be straight without urafa, leaders. So leadership is a truth, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. So leadership is obligation. So we need to have urafa, by the way. Urafa is not leaders meaning khalifa. You have to have a leader for each tribe, for example. Communities, we have in, in Adelaide communities. You have to have a leader for each community. So the Prophet said, Urafa or leadership is a truth. That's why the scholars say said, it's an obligation to have a leader for each group. Okay? So if the system is this, then we have to have that pledge to that leader in order to apply that system that Allah Azza wa Jal wanted. Arafa are representatives. Look at this hadith after the Battle of Hunayn. Remember the Battle of Hunayn? When the Muslims were defeated at the beginning and then they went and defeated the enemies. There were 12,000 fighters. When the delegates of the tribe of Hawazin, after the Hawazin, which were the opponents of the Muslims, were defeated. The Muslims 
actually how was it when they came to the battlefield they came with their wives with their kids with their wealth with everything so they can fight to the end but what happened is they were defeated and they escaped from the battlefield and left home their wives their kids and their wealth they left them in the battlefield and who took that of course the muslims actually took that as a treasure for them so when the delegates of the tribe of Hawazin came to the Prophet Sallallahu and they requested him to return their properties and captives, the Prophet Sallallahu stood up and said to them, I have other people with me in this matter, as you see. And the most beloved statement to me is the true one. You may choose either the properties or the prisoners as I have delayed their distribution. So the Prophet ﷺ kept the prisoners, but distributed what? The wealth. And what did he say to the delegates? Either you choose the money or the prisoners. So what did they choose? The Prophet had waited for them for more than 10 days since his arrival from at Taif. So when it became evident to them that he, the Prophet ﷺ, was not going to return them except one of the two, so they actually waited 10 days without giving him the answer. <laughs> so they would be sacrificing their captives, their wives, their kids. They don't want to sacrifice their wealth. <laughs> then they came to him, they said, we choose our prisoners. So after 10 days, they chose their prisoners. The Prophet ﷺ got up amongst the people and glorified and praised Allah as he deserved and said, Then after, these brethren of yours have come to us with repentance, and I see it logical to retain them the captives. So whoever amongst you likes to do that as a favor, then he can do it. And whoever of you likes to stick to his share till we recompense him, from the very first war booty which Allah will give us, then he can do so. Give up the present captives. The people anonymously said, we do that, return the captives willingly. The Prophet Sallallahu said, we do not know which of you has agreed to it. So everybody stood. Some people said, we agree, we give, we give, we, we so on. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, we do not know which of you has agreed to it and which have not. So go back and let your leaders forward us your decision. And that's where we are up to, which is the democratic way. So go back, let your leaders get your decision, come back to us with their decision. So all of their people then went back, discussed the matter with their leaders, who returned and informed the Prophet ﷺ that all the people had willingly given their consent to return the captives. This is what has reached us about the captives of Hawazin, narrated Anas, that Abbas said to the Prophet ﷺ, I paid for my ransom and Aqil's ransoms. So this is just to show how actually the system that at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, to apply the shura, this is what the Prophet ﷺ used. So he returned them back and asked them to choose a leader, come back and tell us what you want. There are some conditions. We speak about the normal leader and we speak about the Khalifa. The Khalifa, which is the one leader for all the Muslims, the scholars, they said he has to have 10 uh, conditions. So he needs to be a Muslim, he needs to be a just, a male, a mujtahid, not follower. What do you mean by mujtahid? He knows the fiqh. He's not shafi'i. You cannot have the khalifa that is a shafi'i or a hanafi. He needs to be a mujtahid, meaning that he needs to be in the level of fiqh, that he can look at the evidence, not look at following the shafi'i or following a scholar. No, no. The khalifa needs to be a scholar himself. He knows the rulings of everything in Islam. Because he needs to rule everything. Imagine a Khalifa that doesn't know the fiqh of politics, or doesn't know the fiqh of war, 
or doesn't know the fiqh of trading how is he going to build the markets how is he going to build the army and so on even though he can get advices okay if he doesn't know the evidence someone will advise him he can believe it so it will he will be following who the one who advised him but the khalifa needs to be okay i have a shura committee but I come, okay, we want to build a market. Give me your opinions. And give me the evidence of the opinions. Why did you choose that opinion? So he will get the evidence, he will get the opinion, and then because he has the tool of fiqh and the knowledge, he can decide. Not follow one who can tell him, well, I believe that you need to do that. He's the only one who's telling him. He will follow him. So this Khalifa is a follower. He needs to be a number of them and he needs to have the knowledge to differentiate. Okay? Able to take decisions, not a weak, who cannot take decisions. Can hear, see and talk. No disability. He cannot be a disabled person. Qurashi, and this is because the Prophet said that the Khalifas are from Quraysh. He needs to be the descendant of Quraysh. Been chosen according to Islam, not the Islam, according to Islam, to the Islamic ruling, how he was chosen. Need to be free and need to be mature, not acting without measuring, not a, a light person who can decide fast and decide and kill fast and send an army fast without actually maturity. All of these are 10 conditions that the scholars put for the Khalifa, which is the top person. What about the Mahdi? Can you say he needs some kind of the Khalifa? And he's not a scholar himself, as you said. Um, yes, but he will be what? He will not be a Khalifa. Or he will be a Khalifa. Will he? We will see, inshallah. Yeah. Uh, the hadith did not say, the hadith said that he will be. Yes. Yeah. He is, he is from the lineage of the Quraysh. He is, his name is Muhammad bin Abdullah, like the name of the Prophet and so on. So there are lots of hadith. But regardless, we don't want to hang everything until he comes. We want to work. So he can come. Because he cannot come on desert. He needs to come when there are some Supporters, correct? Yes. 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 Allah Azza wa Jal will fix him in a in a second, or Allah will fix with him in a second. There are two narrations we spoke about before. Current application of democracy is that the system democracy is bigger than regulations, meaning that the democracy sets the regulations. This is the current practice in the West. In the Muslim countries, regulations need to be fixed to be according to Allah's law, and the system need to not contradict any of Allah's law. This is the difference. Changes can be gradual, and prohibitions can be accepted at some stages. And here is an example of what you have said. Sometimes, for example, you are in the process of changing the system into an Islamic system in one of the Muslim countries. Because people were not practicing Islam, and then you started teaching them, started becoming practicing Muslims, and they wanted to change the system into an Islamic system regulation in that Muslim country. That change can be gradual, meaning that you can accept some prohibitions at some stages in order to continue slowly, slowly, make the change to reach your goal. So for example, in some of the countries nowadays who are going towards Islam, they are accepting some things that are prohibited in Islam, but it's a step that they are continuing. So the scholars, they said, it's acceptable to have some prohibitions if you are planning to reach a stage where you implement Islamic law altogether. Do you understand that? How did they get into that? Well, the Prophet ﷺ did that. What did the Prophet ﷺ? With the alcohol, for example. With what as well? With the statues. Yeah. 
there were statues around the Kaaba. And there were a lot of al uzza You know, after the Prophet ﷺ, he, he went to, to Hajj or went to Umrah a couple of times and the statues were there. He did not break them. It was not time. He was planning for it, but it was not time. And even after he conquered Mecca, you know, there, there was a statue which is the big, biggest and the first, which is outside Mecca and close to Al Ta'if, which is Al Alat. I think it was either Al Lat or Al Uzza. It was over there and it was a big statue. The Prophet, after conquering Mecca, he did not break it straight away. He waited some time and then he sent someone to break it down. So that gradualism is part of the planning. So you might actually, in a system that is a political system, you might accept some prohibitions at some time. If you are planning to go all the way to the end and implement the law of Allah Azza wa Jal. Did you understand this point of gradualism, Mikhail? So we, at some stage, we might accept, yeah, we might accept some prohibitions to be existing under our ruling because we are planning for it. So we can reach the stage where we can, yes, yeah. Legislative part is for Allah and the application part is for people, which is democracy. Legislative is for Allah. What's halal, what's haram is for Allah. Application, how to apply it, is for people. And they can use democracy for that. Sometimes democracy allows people to vote whether to apply Sharia or not if in the Muslim country when Sharia is not applied. So someone will say, how do you want me to vote to apply Sharia or not? Oh my God, we need to vote, all of us. We need to get Sharia as, for example, in the first but the term in the constitution as Sharia is the main source of all the rules in the country. So we need to vote. And all the Muslims need to come. Some of the Muslims, unfortunately, they come and say, no, you are not as a Muslim allowed to vote on that. What do you want? You want people to vote not to have Sharia or the law of Allah as the law of the country? You cannot. You have to vote. You have to increase the awareness. So when it happens, then Nobody can contradict any of the law of Allah Azza wa Muslims can use democracy to reach power and try to make the change. So you can use democracy because it's a tool. You need to make the change. Nowadays, it's not the change that can be made by uh, force, but by the rules or the tools that are available in the world. Country leader is not required to meet all khalif requirements because we have khalifa requirement, the tens, but country leaders, country leaders are not khalifas. They don't need to meet the requirements. Leaders of the groups, they don't need to meet all the requirements. Omar bin Khattab said that a country leader can't be more than four years. You know, four years, you know how the terms are four years? Nowadays, or all the world, you know who set it at the beginning? It was Umar al-Khattab. He was the one who did not allow any emir of any region to be emir for more than four years. His term is four years and he needs to be changed. And he was saying that if he was just, people will get bored of him. And if he was not just, they will get rid of him after the four years. So... It's something that Amr Khattab at that time said. And you can say that this is democracy. Because democracy states that, for example, the term is four years. And some of the democratic uh, places says two terms only. And you can't do more than two terms. Anyway, so all of these are things that, that can someone say, and did the Prophet Sallallahu state the four years? Has it been said in the Quran? That's a tool. That Amr al-Khattab did ijtihad and then got that. If a person claims that a rule other than the rule of Allah is better, then he exits Islam. This is something that is very important. 
We cannot say, if someone says, democracy, democracy is better than shura. This is a big claim. We need first to ask him, what do you mean by democracy? The people set the regulations and the rules. If he believes that, then he exits Islam. If the person says anything is better than what Allah Azza wa Jal has set for us, then he's not a Muslim. It's up to him, but he's not a Muslim. People are on the religion of their kings. That's a statement, it's a true statement. So if the king is religious, people will be religious. If the king is not, people will be not. Democracy in its current application to choose the leader can be used and is not contradicting shura. So how to choose the leader? What are the conditions of a leader? He needs to be above this certain age. He needs to be with this qualifications. He needs to be done these skills. He needs to be, he needs to be, he needs to be. All of these are tools. All of these are people who agreed on them. Democracy, no problems with that because it's not contradicting Islam. Democracy application within the Western society lead to stability of the countries and so proved as a good tool. So you look at the Western countries, they are stable. Muslim countries, unstable. All the Muslim countries are unstable. Western countries are, are stable. Meaning that the tool proved that it brings safety. So we can use it. And again, I want you to differentiate between the tool itself and the law of Allah. Do you understand me? Using the tool itself to apply the law of Allah, that's not an issue. Using democracy to replace the shura, that's an issue. Using democracy to apply the shura, it's not an issue. Did you get it, Mikhail? Biwa, did you get it? All right. What about, you know, you said, you know, you need a certain age, a certain capability. What about the one of us, so, you are a 17, 18 year old to lead an army? Yeah. And the other people in process and passed away. Do you, ring, do you reckon 17 years old nowadays? I can remember nowadays, yeah. They are kids nowadays. Yeah. Uh, 25 they are kids. How old are you? Sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. I'm just... Some of the 25s are kids. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just joking. So nowadays the ages are not like before. People before were really mature. So it needs to be based on the situation of the country and the time and all of this. So by time maybe they will change the cut of date or age and whatever. So all of this is part of democracy. No I issues. Never didn't think it was suitable for him. He said he was such a young age. All, all of them they followed. Even in his army was Abu Bakr and Umar. No issues. They all followed him, followed Osama. He was 17 years old. So this is again, what I am saying is that democracy interferes with these details. Does not interfere with what is halal, what is haram. Do you understand my... Yeah, understand. Yeah. yeah. So democracy system of identifying who can vote, who can be nominated, how voting happens, and so on, is a tool that can be used in Islam. And nowadays, when we do any of the democratic things, it's, it's just democracy. Any of the regulations that we use for voting is just democracy. Is the difference is that when we are choosing the leader through democracy, the leader will rule according to Allah's rule in Islam. Do you understand this? So that needs to be important. Understood. So when we are choosing the leader through democracy, so we are voting and all following all the democratic procedure for voting for the leader, the leader will rule according to Allah's law in Islam. Okay, got it? Clear? And we rule according to man-made law, according to Western countries, with the things that are not set by the law of Allah. Like, for example, did Allah speak about the law of traffic? No. So that's a law that can be made by human beings. Because Allah did not set. But Allah set some general ruling that you cannot harm. So that ruling of traffic 
need to follow the general rules, which is there should be no harm. And so they need to put the ruling based on that. The legislative body in Islam, for example, the country, the, the parliament, will discuss and vote on country contracts, whether to run a contract for the railway with this country or not, or with this company or not, discuss the punishment that people decided for something that Allah Azza wa did not mention in the Quran or the Sunnah, increment that leaders decided how much we add to their wages and so on. All of these are things that can be decided within the parliament, but they will not vote on what is lawful or unlawful. That needs to be clear. I will, I will stop here so we can, inshallah, next week start and continue for the democracy in the West, especially for the minorities. How do we apply it? When can we apply it? When can't we apply it? If there is any question about that so far for what we have taken, did you understand democracy and how we can say democracy does not contradict Islam or sometimes democracy contradicts Islam? We need to identify between the two types of democracy. Yes. You need to have a lineage. Do you have a lineage tree? I have a lineage tree that goes all the way up to however at the time of the Prophet. So people who are from Quraysh, they have that tree. So they have their lineage all the way to the top. Have you seen any of these lineage trees? Okay. So, it exists with people who are from the tribe of Quraysh and who are related to the Prophet Your second question. Um, yeah, I was just going to say that means that he must be Quraysh and not Quraysh. Yes. He should be Qurashi. And if he is not Qurashi, then he has another name. Like, for example, the Ottomans were not Qurashis. Okay? They call them Hakim Mutagallib, meaning that a ruler by force, which the Prophet said that it will be a ruler ruling by force. It's not going to be a ruling by the way, for example, the shura uh, happens and so on. Okay? Anyone? Is lineage always through the male side or can it be through? Male, female. Male, female. Um, who decides who's part of the shura? The leader? Or? Well, it should be that the leader decides who's part of the shura. At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there were the people who the Prophet ﷺ was satisfied from them and Allah was satisfied from them. They were always put as the shura people. After that, nobody of them exists anymore. So what can we do? We need to generate a tool to identify who needs to be part of the shura. That's why a, a system needs to be established. Sometimes the leader will identify based on the skills and capabilities that this will be part of the shura, this will be, this will not be. Sometimes the group of people, sometimes people put a system to actually the group of people vote who will be in the shura. So it's always a system. There is no clear cut who is going to identify who is the shura. At the time of the companions, it's a different story. That's why we cannot, can someone say, oh, look, we look how the companies applied and we apply. Say to him, in politics, come on, no way. Nobody is trusted nowadays like the time of the companions. So we cannot do what the companions did. All right? Understood? Everything is clear. It's really, really sensitive topic. And next week, inshallah, it will be more sensitive, especially when we speak about politics in the West. What's allowed and what's not allowed. Jazakumullah khair, subhanakallah, alhamdulillah, inshallah,